Right, hello and welcome. It's now four o'clock and we're going to start the housing committee of the 8th of May 2013. Um, if we start off with all the procedural business, so declaration of substitutes, please. Phelan McCafferty. Okay, thank you. Any other substitutes? No, thank you. Um, declaration of interests. Do any, <coughs> excuse me, do any members wish to declare any personal or prejudicial interest in relation to any matters included in the agenda? No, thank you. So moving on. There are no part two items, therefore the press and public will not be excluded from the meeting, so you can stay for the whole meeting and please do. Um, so if we can move to 64, which is the minutes of the Housing Committee meeting of the 6th of May 2013. I beg your pardon, March 2013. Thank you, Councillor peltzer -Dunn. Um, and if you could have a look at those minutes briefly they were circulated in advance and so can I ask that members do members agree that the minutes of the 6th of March 2013 are a correct record of that meeting agreed wonderful thank you then we move on to item 65 got a matter arising. Oh, thank you. Sorry, minutes. Councillor Farrow. Councillor Farrow, matter arising. Yes, page 8, yeah. item 58.2, um, and it's halfway down on, on page 8, um, and, it, and it read, a written report back to Housing Committee on the 8th of May. Have we got that written report for this meeting, Chair? Where are we? Sorry, Councillor Farrow, I'm trying to find that in the paper. Page, page 8, halfway down. Page 8, thank you. Third paragraph. Page 8, third paragraph. Committee, 8th of May. I don't believe we had. Could an officer answer on that one, please? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of being able to progress report, we haven't been able to bring one to this meeting, but we have had a discussion um, with the HCA, both um, the region. We've had a meeting with the HCA um, to discuss um, what are the opportunities around this. So we will be bringing back a report to the earliest possible um, committee. Thank you, Councillor Farrow. And Councillor Mears, did you have a matter arising? Yes, thank you, Chair. Just for clarification, on page 355.8, when it talks about the sale of the Whitehall Library uh, site, although this is, um, comes under the general fund, I did ask a question around the shortfall to the project uh, because there is still another million pound shortfall. So I would like, I'm sure the committee would like an update. Mm, certainly. Um, I think I'll have to give um, members uh, a report in writing, a note in writing on that. Thank you. Are there any other matters arising from the minutes? No? Thank you. Um, where did I get up to? Did I do both? Did I do the Housing Management Consultative Committee one as well? Did we both agree to it? Yeah? So now I'm 66, yeah? I'm now, I haven't got 65 yet, thank you. <laughs> okay, in the minutes of the Housing Management Consultative Subcommittee meeting held on the 26th of March 2013 on page 13 of your agenda, these minutes are for information only, so they don't need to be agreed, but they're in there because it's, it's you know, it's only right and proper that we know what Housing Management Committee are talking about in that meeting, and likewise, they know what we're talking about in our meeting. So, okay. Is there anything that anybody wanted to raise in those? They obviously don't need agreement by us, but if, if there's anything we can help anybody with, if anybody's got a query, I'm happy to ask officers to help us. 
No, thank you very much. Okay, so Chair's communication. I'm sorry, Councillor Jarrett. Sorry, Chair, a bit slow off the mark there. Um, 53.10, um, Mr. Crowhurst asked if there could be a rapid response unit for sheltered housing. Um, I, yeah. I, 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 I know that Mr. Mr. Huntback gave us a, a response. Um, it, what, are we, do we have any further information about that or um, it, was that considered to be a, a, a full answer there? I'm sorry, which number was that, Councillor Jarrett? Um, 53.10, um, Rapid Response <laughs> Unit for Sheltered Housing. Um, we, we had a response that it was trusted assessors, but I, 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 I'd, I'd like some confirmation that that actually is That's the same as a Rapid Response Unit. Okay. If, if perhaps we could note that for a future. Can anybody give an answer to that, or shall we? Or is, or is, or will you? You'll come back to Councillor Jarrett on that. Yes. Will you? Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Now I'm on 66. Chairs, chairs, communi chairs, communications. Um, earlier this week, I went to. Um, Sorry, my brain's not working. Earlier this week, I went to Balchon Court in, in, um, in my ward in Hanover, um, which was a, is a brand new council housing development. And um, thanks to Councillor Mears for putting those wheels in motion before I came into power. Um, and um, the keys were handed over from Kears to the housing management team. And so that's a big step forward. So that's something that I think is a real celebration to be had and very shortly the first tenants will be moving in and I was so impressed with the actual standard of the housing there it was bright it was airy it was spacious it was just it would be a lovely place to live maybe quite envious compared to my own rather pokey little house actually so it was an absolutely lovely place to live I'm sure that if I had it I'd soon fill it up with junk though but it was absolutely brilliant place so I was very very pleased and I'm sure that other people on this committee would and if 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 anybody wants to have a visit arranged to actually go and see it we can arrange that for you because it it's just it's just something to celebrate it's something it's a really positive thing so call over I'm calling over um, all the, well, the one report and one presentation that are on the um, on in our papers today and that we've got a deputation so there's no petitions or written questions from the public we've got we've got one deputation the deputation is from Brighton Benefits Campaign who I should have said in chairman's in chair's communications welcome to our meeting today it's really good to see people taking part in the council process and you're very very welcome to be here and many of your sentiments you'll find a number of us here actually agree with so we've got a deputation from Brighton Benefits campaign and the spokesperson will be Miss Maureen Pilby the deputation results to the under occupancy penalties for social housing tenants and Miss Pilby um, if you would please present your deputation um, and I've actually checked the ruling, well, the lawyers have checked the ruling, and I am allowed to be flexible in how much time I give you, we're in reason. And so it says five minutes, I'm actually quite happy to give you ten minutes, and that's in my gift as chair. But if you could try and keep to ten minutes, that would be really helpful. Thank you. If you'd like to start, you've got a microphone in front of you there. Um, sorry, <laughs> not done this before. This is a statement from the Brighton Bedroom Tax Victim Support Group. Imagine you've invested a lot of time and effort in improving your council house over the years. You've always paid the rent on time, your family have flown the nest successfully, and the grandchildren are a joy. Then tragedy hits. Your daughter dies. And suddenly, in midlife, you're pitched back into the work of full-time parenting again looking after two young granddaughters. Now you're told that despite your poverty and despite your enlarged household, you must pay a penalty for under-occupying, when in fact your teenage grandson 
comes to stay for half the week to be with his sisters and sleeps in the box room. It's a painful reminder that how real families live doesn't count for anything when it comes to the bedroom tax. Or you are seriously ill, constantly tired and in pain. You've had to give up so much of the life you had before, but at least your flat is above the neighbourhood shop and at least it's adapted in so many ways for your needs. And at least you have long-lasting neighbours who support and look out for you. It's your home. Now you're told that you must move and the stress and disruption is more than you can even bear to think about. Or your children no longer live with you, but they're all close by. One is a single parent and you try to help out by having the grandchildren to stay occasionally. Your own health is not good, but you're an active person in the community despite it, and your home there is your bedrock. Paying the bedroom tax will reduce your income so far beneath the breadline that you just don't know how you'll manage. You cannot eat properly, and you've lost the energy to help others like you used to, and it's now a daily struggle not just to sink into despair. Or you both have serious physical and mental illnesses and have carers coming in every single day. You feel safe with good neighbours around you and you're so glad that your garden lets you keep your beloved pets. Moving is unimaginable. New people, new situations are just too much to cope with alongside your illness. A discretionary housing payment seems to offer hope, but then you're told it's only for people who agree to move, and you are refused it. You think, how can they get away with telling me to pay the bedroom tax from money that's supposed to be for housing, sorry, not supposed to be for housing, but for the extra costs I have because of my disabilities? You wonder what will become of you with cuts in the real value of social security benefits for years to come and council tax to pay and now this. It's so heartless that you wonder if the intention of it all is to drive you to suicide. Then no doubt the money that was supposed to keep you alive will come in handy for cuts for the well off. You can imagine this but these are not imaginary cases, nor are they unusual. They are all victims of the bedroom tax here in Brighton and Hove. These are tenants we've spoken to, but many others tell us they're simply too frightened to draw attention to themselves because they are regularly blamed for wrecking the economy, abused and vilified by central government and the press for claiming benefits they are entitled to by law. What is a home? Just four walls, a roof, decent home standards. Tenants say no. Our homes should be places where security, continuity, pride in ourselves and our achievements, our memories and our family history are fully respected, just as they are in owner-occupied housing. Our homes should guarantee us a place within a community through a network of ties and responsibilities. All of this is threatened and that's why the bedroom tax is met with such hostility. None of us voted for our homes to become little more than housing units so that we can be moved about like little packages and as one young mum put it, by people whose master bedroom would take up most of the upstairs in my house. Our houses are so small anyway, and they're telling us that we might have to move again and again. How do you put down roots like that? What's the point of putting any money into your home? What if we get sick and we lose our jobs? What is it private sector housing where vastly more under-occupation takes place? Why is it poor people in public sector housing who are targeted? Why is the housing benefit blame bill blamed on us? We're not the private landlords.
that central government is happy to see making a killing out of the housing shortage. Where are the rent controls? We the least off, well off are blamed when we live in a country stuffed full of private, half-filled, empty mansions, second homes and holiday homes. The government is ducking any responsibility for this housing crisis and refusing to invest in social housing, which would create desperately needed jobs as well as homes. The report before this committee was written for an administration that say they are committed to a no eviction policy. Let's be clear what it says. Paragraph 3.8, if you won't pay, we will evict you. Paragraph 9.1, we will chase your debts even after eviction. 9.2, we will use debt recovery agencies. We will take money directly from your benefits. 3.7, people will be pressurised to pay off their bedroom tax arrears even if they wish to downsize. Paragraphs 2.3, 2.4. This report proposes adding £70,000 to the DHP dependent upon the Secretary of State. This would only be only 10% of the amount people are losing. Paragraphs 3.12 to 314. There is no guarantee to take further action after this initial money runs out. Paragraph 3.2. The report restates that the Council will be using all its powers to recover our rent arrears. 3.11. There is no intention to defy the government. This is not a report about defying an unjust law. This is not a report planning how to defend the weakest and most vulnerable people in our society. This is not a report that suggests any plans whatsoever for an alliance between tenants and their council to defend tenants from the tax and get rid of it. It is, an appropriate, it is a report planning how to do the government's dirty work for them in a locally appropriate way. It is a report which will lead to further misery, family breakup, illness, legal persecution, premature death, and even suicide amongst the people the council has the strongest duty to protect. This is what the council should do. State publicly and repeatedly that no evictions of council tenants will under any circumstances take place for arrears of bedroom tax. Promise to do all in your power to defy this unjust tax. Remind council staff that they have no moral obligation to enact an unjust tax and encourage them to defy it. Encourage them too to defy any of their managers who bully them to implement the tax in any way, for instance, by sending out intimidating letters to tenants, by taking part in appointments with tenants to pressurise them to pay the tax or to move home inappropriately by organising debt recovery measures, by blocking tenants and arrears from, from participation in the home move transfer system and so on. Encourage council staff to meet together to plan how to support tenants' defiance of this tax. Actively encourage their trade unions to support them. Mm -hmm. Encourage council staff to use all their meetings with tenants to support them in their defiance of this tax. Extend the deadline but for appeals by a further month and provide clear and simple information to tenants about how to appeal and upon what grounds they may do so. Reclassify housing by counting a spare bedroom, as other householders do, as a vital study room, storage space, guest room or sick room block any restrictions upon tenants and arrears from transfers in the home move system. If the council does not agree to these simple measures of solidarity and protection for tenants victims of this tax, then the radical sounding resolution proposed to this committee will, if passed, be no more than hot air. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you will, there, there, there are a lot of people in this room today who agree with what you've, what you've said today. You. And we have, um, there is an amendment to the paper which you'll be interested in hearing about mm -hmm. in a while, which will, the amendment addresses a lot of the concerns that you've raised. So what happens now is that there's no, we don't, the deputation, the deputation's delivered, you've delivered your deputation, it's to help us, inf it helps us inform us when we have our discussion to go with the paper. Yeah. So that, that's how it works. Um, it's, I'm just checking I'm doing the right thing. Um, so now I think we move straight on to the paper. Is that correct? That, that's the correct process, isn't it? Do we take the, do we take the written deputation? Do we, we agree to note it. So if, you, if you'd like to pass that, pass that up, that's re really, it's really, really heartfelt. And thank you so much for that. And certainly, you know, speaking as chair, and I'm sure other councillors around the room from whichever party have had this as well, I've had a number of emails and phone calls from people that are so frightened by the bedroom tax, genuinely, genuinely concerned about how it's going to affect them. And I mean, I know going back to my own childhood, I was brought up on a council estate on an old estate with my mum and dad, and I know that if that had happened to my mum at the point where I went off to university, she would have been, or when I got back from university, she would have, it, it, it was a home still for many years for her, and she would have really, really you know, not wanted to leave it because of mm. various rescued animals and things she had. So it's, uh, it's our know, homes. a heartfelt yeah. idea of a heartfelt. It is your home, and I do, I do you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really with you in heart for that. So thank you so much. Okay. And now we're going to move on to the actual paper. Okay, so thank you. So we're now moving on to... Item 70, which is the paper minimising the risk Madam, of... Madam Chair, I assume that 69, there's nothing. So, uh, yeah, uh, okay, no, 69, there are no petitions, written questions, letters or notice of motions from councillors. So, item 70, um, minimising the risk of evictions caused by the housing benefit social rented sector size criteria. Um, it's in the addendum in your report. There's also been an a sheet handed around just by Councillor McCafferty passed a sheet around with further amendments just earlier before the meeting and I'd like a Dodo Daffy who's just here on my right to present the report as it stands or when we have I'm sorry I'm, getting, I'm looking to officers because I have never done this before I'm looking to officers when we have um, if we have Um, uh, an amendment to the recommendations. Do we take that after the reports presented as it is? Is that the normal process? Okay, in which case I'll ask, and then we discuss the amendments. Thank you. It's just that I have never been in this position before. So, Adoda, would you like to present the paper? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. The subject of this report is about minimising the risk of evictions to council tenants impacted by the Housing Benefit Social Rented Sector Size Criteria, or otherwise known as Under Occupation Charge. The policy context for this is that a notice of motion in relation to the reduction in housing benefit for people who are under, under occupying council housing was considered at full council on the 28th of March, where the council agreed to ask the relevant committee to look at this matter. The Council is very much committed to making better use of the City's housing resources and it has a very strong track record of initiatives that encourage this and also a strong track record um, in preventing homelessness wherever possible. The report before you today proposes consultation with Council tenants to develop an approach to minimise the potential risk of eviction to tenants affected by this particular strand of the welfare reform changes. And it proposes some urgent action in response to the immediacy of the benefit changes. So the recommendations for Housing Committee are two. One, 
Note the Council resolution attacked, uh, attached as Appendix 1. 2. Request that area panels consider the issue and the proposals presented here in order for their feedback to be considered by Housing Committee in the autumn of this year. 3. That the committee earmark a one-off amount of £70,000 from the Housing Revenue Account to support urgent initiatives to minimise the risk of eviction. And four, that Secretary of State consent is sought to use that funding to supplement the discretionary housing payment fund for special allocation to council tenants. So some key aspects of the report are that the range of welfare reform changes are you know, very complex and the potential cumulative impacts on individuals are not entirely easy to predict. However, in order for the Council to maintain its financial resilience and to meet its duties to Council taxpayers, it is essential for the Council to collect rents and other charges and to give clear and consistent messages about the importance of paying rent, Council tax and other charges. Also, that we follow through on our support, but also our recovery action where there is non-payment. Part of that support is about acknowledging the severe hardship that some households and vulnerable people will face and taking early action to help maintain their homes or to, move, or to enable them to move to more affordable accommodation. The Government has made available to Brighton and Hove City Council the sum of around a million pounds for our discretionary housing payment fund for 2013 to 14. And while this sum provides provision for exceptional circumstances, it is worth noting that for the city, it is set against a backdrop in total reduction in housing benefits alone of around 11 to 12 million pounds. Paragraphs 3.7 to 3.10 of the report highlight a range of actions the council has already taken to seek to mitigate some of the impacts of the welfare reform changes. And the recommendations before you today are intended to ensure that we can be nimble in response to the most severe cases that may present during the year. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dodo. So, on the report, are there any questions on the report as it stands at the moment? Councillor Farrow, I'll just write your names down so I make sure I get you all down. So I've got, I've got Councillor Farrow, I've got Councillor Jarrett, and I've got Councillor Mears. So, Councillor Farrow. Thank you, Chair. Just to clarify, these are questions because I do want to make a contribution later, as I'm sure a lot of councillors here. But I have a question. Questions first. Yes. yes. And it's on, uh, concerning page 4, 3.7. And this, our current advice to tenants has been to, and I am concerned about two of these bullet points. And the first one I'm concerned about, and I'd like some explanation of how this is going to work, move to smaller accommodation, either through the transfer incentive scheme or by doing a mutual exchange. And then the one that really sticks in my throat, um, bullet point three, pay the rent shortfall. Can officers please explain how these can actually be implemented in the current situation, Chair? Thank you, Councillor Farrow. Is, who would like to respond to that, please? Thank you for the questions, Councillor Farrow. Um, in terms of moving to small accommodation, either through the transfer incentive scheme or by mutual exchange, um, we are aware that not every single council tenant who might want to move will be able to move immediately under those schemes if there isn't the accommodation for them to move to. However, there are also many um, council tenants who have um, either for the first time become, uh, put an application in to move under the home move scheme or are very much interested in carrying out a mutual exchange. Um, so that's in terms of that question. And then the... Could you give me some indication? I know you can't give me exact figures, but give me some figures, because from my information, I don't believe that these schemes work very efficiently at the moment and the pressure that there's going to be put under. So could you give me some indication of, of the current numbers and the expected numbers because of the current situation? 
Um, I haven't got exact figures here, so we can come back to an, an, we can come back to you with information on the uh, numbers of people, for example, on, e on all three schemes. So we're talking about three things here: the home move, the, the home move scheme, um, the people applying for transfer incentive, and also people applying for mutual exchange. Um, so we can apply, we can supply figures another time. But just to say, in terms of the visits that officers have been carrying out to all the tenants um, affected by the um, ben benefit changes in terms of under occupation, around half of the tenants that we speak to are very much interested in moving to alternative accommodation. So some want to stay exactly where they are, some would like to move to smaller accommodation, and, and that is around 50%. But in terms of the, the second question you've just asked, we can provide you with um, some more details on exact figures at another time. Um, and related to the second part of your question in terms of paying the rent shortfall, again, on some of our visits and uh, with, as, with information from across the country from other local authorities, um, what some tenants want to do, have chosen to do, although they acknowledge it would be difficult, is they would rather stay in their own accommodation and find alternative ways of meeting the shortfall between what they were getting for housing benefit and then what they were advised that they were likely to be getting in housing benefit following the implementation of this part of the welfare reform. Um, bearing in mind that at the time it was, they, they were, um, this is what they intended to do to meet the shortfall. The reality of it is um, what we're finding now, sometimes the reality of it is harder for some people than they'd anticipated. Um, but also, we are aware that some, for some families, for some households, um, the change in the um, housing benefit regulations meant that it might be for a period of a couple of years or a, couple, a few months where they were going to be, have a reduction in their housing benefit. And their circumstances would change either after a child reached um, over age 10 or if they themselves reach pensionable age. So what many people have been telling us where that is the situation is that for the months leading up to the change that they know is coming, they would rather meet the shortfall in their rent rather than move. So it's those kinds of situations where some people have preferred to do that. Thank you, Adodo. Um, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Um, this is a situation where we're in slightly new territory and as you've indicated we don't know exactly how people are going to respond to all these changes. Um, what um, processes are there going to be for monitoring the, um, the situation and reporting back to the Housing Committee? Thank you for that question, Councillor Jarrett. Um, the processes we've got are quite wide and varied really. Um, some of the um, for example, we have, uh, we're, we're trying to monitor, we, we're still visiting um, people that are impacted by this, and so we're very much in touch with a lot of the residents. Um, part of the work of our housing income management team, um, the work they do is keep in touch with people who are facing hardship and looking at how we can support them to make sure that they either do not fall into arrears or that their arrears are minimised or, or you know, kept to a level that they can, um, that, that can be repaid in time. Um, we've also got our financial inclusion team who are, you know, who are doing uh, lots of work around trying to make sure that people are referred to appropriate advice and support agencies. Um, but in terms of the monitoring, we're keeping track of um, how, we're, how either ourselves as a council or other agencies within the city have been able to support people that have been referred to us or to them. So, for example, we already know now that some of the cases that were referred to the um, Money Advice and Community Support Service uh, that we contracted for council tenants, that there have been you know, several cases, handfuls of cases, where people have had benefits backdated that they didn't know that they were entitled to, or benefits that have been reinstated because they'd ceased because they you know, failed to submit a form or something. So there are many cases, and we're tracking all of them, 
where there have been some positive changes, and we know that there will be some cases where it's not so positive, you know, such positive news. But what we're trying, and what we will be doing is also reviewing what is happening across the country as well, and that's when we'll be able to come back to this committee with more information about exactly what is happening on the ground here and uh, other actions that we propose to take to help mitigate some of the um, changes, impacts. Thank you, Dodo. Councillor Mears. Thank you, Chair. I've got a number of questions just to clarify on the report, and then I'd like to come back later in, in further into the debate. So for clarity, uh, and I just wanted confirmation of whether particularly around the Constitution, because on 3.12, this report talks about going out to area panels and uh, housing management. Now, we always, in the past, have consulted tenants through area panels and housing management, and then it's come to housing committee. This report is totally the other way around, and I am concerned that tenants aren't going to be consulted on this first. It talks about the autumn, no date in the autumn, so we have no indication how tenants feel about this in, from, from their reps. Bearing in mind that the HRA is a ring fence budget made up predominantly of tenants' rents. So I am concerned that this has come in this format Personally, I think it's the wrong way round. It should never have come here without the work you could have called uh, emergency area panels or an, a housing management to, to have the information here, consultation information here for this report. So constitutionally, I am concerned. So I just want clarification that there's been no changes within the constitution around consultation with tenants. And on page um, four... Um, 3.8, just for clarity, just so that I understand um, the way this is laid out. It talks about additional uh, funding for two years for the council's own welfare rights service. So are we saying that's from the general fund? If I tell you those questions on then perhaps you can answer my questions. And then it talks about money advice contracts being commissioned for both council tenants. So, is, so obviously there will be a cost out of that for the HRA. I'm not sure if there's anything from the general fund on that. And then it talks about two learning and participation officers. Well, that clearly will come out of the HRA, and we don't see any costings around that. Then it talks of 3.9. It talks about the council's financial inclusion strategy. So are we saying in this report that is the general fund and there's nothing out of the HRA around that? And then it talks about work within the council and other organisations in the city. So it is that joint work out of the HRA and the general fund? Because the report is very unclear. So if you could just clarify those points for me. And also, could you just clarify for me um, the recommendations around this, this re the reduction in subsidy? Is this the same as the uh, local housing allowances that were brought forward in 2008 because I know tis, that the size criteria that the then Labour government brought out in 2008 under the local housing allowance is exactly the same criteria that we have before us today. So, and that was for the private sector and as we know 25% uh, of our housing is in the social sector but 75% is in the private sector, and these allowances were changed in 2008. So could you just clarify for me that we, that's exactly what happened in 2008 is what's been proposed here? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mears. It's a whole raft of questions there from Councillor Mears. Um, I think this is Jim. So, so, I think this is Jim. Liz? Thank you, because that was about constitution. Sorry, Councillor Mears. Oh, your... <laughs> There's nothing in the Constitution which actually requires matters to go through the area panels to the subcommittee up to the Housing Committee. That's just as it's developed by way of custom and practice. But this was a notice of motion. The Chair has asked for a report to come here first, and hence the suggestion that it goes back through the process and comes back to you. But there's no legal requirement for it to go to tenants first. Um, one thing I add to that is that I did actually ask that emergency area panels would be called, but it was impossible to do it in the time 
span and this, this this is the committee that this needed to come to and it was officers told me that it was impossible to actually arrange those emergency meetings within the time which I think was a great shame because otherwise we'd have done it that way around. Just okay. for clarification on that chair, you are the chair so I would just add that point, thank you. I am quite aware of that, thank you Councillor Mears. Um, so, who's going to answer the other queries, questions that Councillor Mears raised? Thank you, Adodo. Um, thank you, Councillor Mears, for your second, the second part of the question was around general fund and HRA. And I can confirm that um, the additional funding for the welfare rights service, that is general fund. Um, the second part you asked about um, in terms of the money advice contracts, that's um, Part of that was general fund and part of it was HRA. We, we brought a report to a uh, housing management consultative subcommittee on the money advice and community service contract. The two learning and participation officers um, are HRA. They're HRA officers who work with council tenants. And the uh, joint work that we're doing with um, other organisations, that's a mixture of... Um, uh, HRA in general fund. So um, as uh, you know, the welfare reforms are, are quite wide ranging and, and affecting many people across the city. So while we're doing a whole programme of work to support council tenants, um, there is also a whole range, a whole, um, a whole programme of other works going on across the city to support residents in the city generally. Uh, the Council's financial inclusion strategy. Um, the Council's financial inclusion strategy is it, that it, that is a, a corporate strategy, and part of and there are um, elements within that strategy that will be around the work that we're doing within housing, directly relating to council tenants. But otherwise, it's you know, so it's a it's a it's an all-encompassing strategy for the whole of the council. Is it funded from the general fund or, or is it, so are you saying there's a contribution in there from the HRA? Really I'm saying uh, essentially I'm saying both but it's not but the there aren't there are several actions for different parts of the council or different departments and there's a there's a program of work that we're doing with council tenants which will be HRA funded contributes to the overall council's um, financial inclusion strategy within the city. So some work within that strategy will be HRA funded and there'll be a raft of other work which is um, uh, from the general fund. Just, just so that I'm, I'm clear because obviously we, you know, the HRA is a separate ring fence budget and I'm not quite clear. So do we have a breakdown then between what, what is paid out of the HRA out of tenants' rents for the, the social inclusion, at, which we should have in the HRA budget? I, w I would be interested to see that and the contribution from the general fund. So if, if that could be arranged, thank you. Thank you. I think Sue Chapman, can you reply on that one? The 13-14 budget report, which was approved at Council on um, the 28th of February, identified £150,000 as being the funding from the HRA for the financial inclusion, particularly to support households in difficulty. So that's the actual figure. And the two learning and participation offices are partly funded from Interreg, um, which is European funding grant. Sorry, Chair, just through that, but it would have been, been helpful for Housing Committee then to have had a report on that because this is Housing Committee. If staff are being brought in through Interreg, it would have been very interested to be notified. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Mears. Um, I do seem to recall that coming to Housing Committee, actually. I haven't got it here in front of me, but I do seem to remember it coming to Housing Committee. Um, but as I say, I haven't got the proof in, on paper here at the moment, but I seem to remember that. Okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't have an iPad then. If I had my iPad then, it would have been on here, Councillor Phelps and <laughs> um, You lose nothing when it's on here unless you lose the thing itself. Um, okay. So I th that was questions. Um, are there any other questions or shall we now move to debate on it? So are there any quest other questions? So I've got, I've got Councillor Powell. 
Any other questions? I've got Councillor Peltzer Dunn and I've got <laughs> Councillor Fitch. It's Councillor Powell and Councillor Jarrett. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And firstly, may I thank the lady, was it Ms. Pillbeam, who uh, delivered this speech at the beginning. Thank you very much. It was, it was very moving and very to the point. And um, thank you for coming today. It made it very clear what we're up against. Um, it's a couple of comments, it's a couple of questions, so anyway, I'm going to go on to um, page four, which is what Councillor Mears was talking about earlier, and page five. Can I just be quite clear that um, Councillor Mears is, is going on about which budget it's from and consultation when it's actually her government that is pushing this through? Can we be quite clear about that? And this is what we're up against. So, okay, so moving into the questions. Your questions. Moving into the moment. questions, if I may. I've just... I've I've just that reminded, is that. sorry, I've just reminded Councillor Powell, and I'm going to be fair to all sides here in the debate, and we're still on questions, that we are still on questions at the moment. We'll have plenty but of there we are, just to, just to make the point. Okay, so coming back to point, page four, uh, first of all, I want, I want to, I want to pay tribute to, to some of the officers here who are doing their very best against um, difficult circumstances to provide help for those that need um, help in moving on. You've got the learning participation people, money welfare, blah, blah, blah. I just wanted to ask, you know, having, and still working in the area where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a careers officer, so my job is to move people on best way I can. Very difficult when there are no jobs out there, but has the council taken into account that it takes an absolute age to get somebody moved on to a work ready stage? It can take years. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to know, in, in sort of a timely fashion, where does the, um, the the benefit bedroom tax, if you like, fit in to getting somebody up to working? Because I can't imagine what it must be like if somebody's about to lose their home, but they're also under the threat of losing all their benefits and they need to work. I mean, for goodness sake, how much pressure can you put on somebody? So I wanted to know, how is the council trying to deal with that you know you're putting support in place but on the other hand you could be saying you're not getting a job quick enough but you're about to lose your flat as well so that's one point that's and one the second point. point i wanted to make is the financial inclusion strategy i'd like to know more about it really because and i think it should be brought to committee because okay. we're talking here about digital inclusion and again coming back to the group i work for trying very quickly to try and get options ready for people, you know, where they can actually train to use a computer. But, you know, we need to know more about this. Is it a group yeah. you, that tenants can contact? How is this yeah. being delivered? That Thank you. That information is there and can be shared. But um, who? It's already been to this committee. Yes, yes, it did, it did come to, it did, it did, but we'd like to know more. That's absolutely fine. And these things are, they're a moving feast, aren't they? Things change and adapt to suit the purpose. So an update on that coming to committee would be very useful. Um, so the other thing about jobs and... I think it might be easier for me to, to respond to that because it sort of extends beyond other people's briefs, I think. Um, I don't have, there's no precise answer to say is there an actual stage plan between someone being approached who may not be in work at this particular point in time and those people getting into work. And obviously the circumstances of individuals can vary because there'll be some people who won't have worked for a particular long time if they had childcare responsibilities possibly or caring responsibilities and other people who are may have lost their jobs and are looking to get a new job and are actively searching for it. Um, what I can say is that um, through the various partnerships that we have as a council, um, we're in communication with Job Centre Plus, um, who places, you know, I've got a very good record at the moment of placing people into employment. Um, we also work hard on um, getting apprenticeships for um, people who may be changing their job careers and trying to find other, other skills to get into um, paid employment. Um, and we, we also are in discussion with housing associations uh, in terms of how we can collaborate in terms of ways of bringing um, initiatives that we, um, we collectively have to help with employment schemes, learning and development schemes and training schemes for adults in the city. Um, I can, we'll be able to provide you a more detailed written answer, but that's a, a broad brush um, synopsis. Thank you, Jeff. You can come back briefly, Councillor Powell. I think the question really was, is the council aware of the timeliness of this in terms of getting somebody to a work-ready stage on the one hand, pardon me, and then having the threat of losing their home on the other hand? Are you, how are you balancing that, please? Mm. 
It is an important, because it has a knock-on effect one to the other. I can, I can appreciate where your question is coming from, Councillor Powell. Should I try? Yeah. Um, Yes, I completely appreciate what you're saying and, and the, the, the context and the, and the reason for the question. Um, the thing is, I think what we're trying to do is do anything that a particular individual needs to support them into work. So, so for some people, it might be something that's really quick and easy. And, and, and for other people, it will be a much longer process and a much slower process. However, what we're trying to do is do something now. Well, we've been doing that, you know, for for several years. But with our, but with, but with our, um, but with our new work and learning support team, they are trying to, you know, look at the individuals and, and respond to individual needs and trying to get people, for example, into volunteering or into work placements so that they can get some experience. So we know that for some people it might take time, but. We're trying to do something because the other impacts in terms of the welfare changes on their lives is happening now. But we're, you know, yeah. so we're just doing what we can. Thank you, Dodo. And you know, we are very well aware of the fact that there, there are very few jobs out there for people. Actually, it's a real, real difficult thing at the moment. Um, okay, going down my list. Um, Councillor Peltzer done. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just for clarification, you mentioned that you were having questions now and then the debate. Mm. Could I just actually um, clarify that you will permit questions following the debate? Well, yes, that's fine. I'm that's grateful. Fine. Thank you. That's fine. Because things will come up during debate that people will then want an answer to, so that seems very sensible. Um, Councillor Farrow. No, it wasn't Councillor Farrow. No, you've, you've both got... Um, both of your surnames... It's the two X, so That's yeah. it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Councillor Fitch. <laughs> yes. Um, Chair, I, is it not true that the Labour and Cooperative Group at the Budget Council had a, an amendment accepted that put more finances in to the staffing and uh, from the rate fund to help with benefits because we saw this developing? Um, yes. It was... It was, yes, I think it was, yes. I think you're absolutely right, Councillor Fitch. Unless anybody corrects me. No, fair enough. So that's a, that was an easy one to answer, Councillor Fitch. Absolutely. And thank you for doing that. Um, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. Um, th there was a suggestion from the deputation that there might be a danger of bullying by managers of staff within the housing department in order to get them to carry out, I suppose, unpleasant actions. Now, I think I know the answer to this, but could I have a reassurance that that sort of behaviour would not ever be tolerated in the housing department of Brighton Hove City Council? Thank you, Councillor Jarrett. And who would like to say something on that? Well, um, first of all, you know, councillors would all know that we've adopted um, corporate values and bullying um, is uh, firmly um, to be condemned. We do not try and bully staff as, um, as a senior management team or managers throughout the organisation. That would be completely contrary to our, our role as managers. Um, what I would say is that we are there to undertake the policies of the council. Um, and there may be times, I suppose, when uh, an individual feels that they don't want to undertake the policies of the councils, and then that would have to be dealt with through our, our normal management measures. But I, that wouldn't be in the form of bullying. That would be in the form of conversations with staff about what is the council's policy and how do we undertake that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Raw, has that happened? Sorry, Jeff Raw. <laughs> there we are. I was elevating you there. Or, or, or whatever. <laughs> um, Councillor Jarrett, has that reassured you? Thank you. Well, no, no I was going maybe to. Maybe elevating isn't quite the word I wanted to use there. Um, right, so that is the end of people who wanted to question as far as the list that I've got. So now we move on to. Councillor Farrow, have you got a question? No, no. no okay. Now we move on to debate. Um, Councillor Farrow, you can be the first one to kick off on that. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, I mean, Chair, as you know, I think over the last two years on this housing committee, we've tried to cooperate. Yep. Um, 
I think all, all councillors on this committee have tried to do so because we have a housing crisis already in the city. Um, obviously, everyone want, wants to produce more social housing. It's very difficult, and as has been said earlier, you know, the national government is virtually withdrawing all funding, so it's going to be increasingly difficult. But we're in a very different situation now, and I think we need to put the blame fairly and squarely where it belongs. We have a national coalition government led by the Conservative Party that's decided to actually wage war on working people in this city and across the country. So that's the situation we're in. The bedroom tax and these benefit cuts are just part of their campaign to do so. Most of the councillors around this um, room actually represent states. And on those estates, we obviously have council tenants, we've got social housing tenants, we've got private tenants. They're all going to come under the cosh now. And certainly, we as a council need to do something about it. But that means being part of a campaign, and we mustn't give false hope to people. And I did raise this with you before, so it's, it's not something new I've said to you, Chair, that I think that you personally, on behalf of your administration, did give false hope to the tenants of this city by raising before discussing with others about what we could actually do because I think it's going to be very difficult to actually provide protection for the, cities, uh, for the residents and the tenants of this city. Now, yes, we're going to try and do something, but what are we doing today? Um, well, again, I'm going to be open, as you know. It was you and I that actually forced through at the last pre-meeting that we actually do what we're doing today. Yeah. Um, I agree. It wasn't going to happen. It was going to be kicked into the long grass and asked area panels to actually cons consider it when tenants are going to be hit from no. last yeah. month. So we do need to do something, but what are we going to do? We're going to go cap in hand to Eric Pickles to ask for 70,000 quid, which he could well just at his whim refuse anyway, and it's going to give 70 quid to those thousand people that are initially going to be affected. Now, all right, we know that um, the <coughs> Policy and Resources Committee have got a million quid to actually for the emergency fund. But we know that it's 14 million quid that's being cut from benefits for our residents and tenants across this city. What we need to do is be part of a national campaign, as was the campaign against the poll tax. That's the only way to treat governments like this. Yes, we need to fight as a council, but I think tenants and residents have got to be realistic about what we can do as councillors. Yes, we will fight for those, rep uh, for those tenants on our estates, but we need to come together. We need to be cooperators, and at the moment, I don't see the cooperation in this city that we require to defend the working people that we represent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Farrow. And a lot of your vast majority of what you said there, I, I totally agree with. Um, other, I've got Councillor Jarrett and other people. Please put your hands up if you wish to contribute to um, debate. Thank you. If, if I could just pick up on a few different points. Um, there was a comment from the deputation about all contact with tenants to be positive. Um, I think I would, I would probably be fairly safe in saying that that is already um, housing department policy. Um, if, it's not, if it's not happening, then that needs to be reported. Um, and certainly um, it does no harm to, to re-emphasise here and now that we do expect all contacts with tenants to be positive. People here are being visited with um, a, a set of circumstances which are not of their own, own making. They're being dumped on them from on high from the government, um, and they're being hit from several sides at once by a number of different things. In the middle of a triple dip recession, they're also being hit with cuts to benefits and told to find non-existent jobs. So I think, obviously, we have to be um, sympathetic to people that find themselves in very difficult situations. I, um, I have the misfortune of answering the, the, the same phone that, that Councillor Wakefield answers sometimes, and I've had a number of very distressed tenants 
um, very, very anxious to, talking about sleepless nights and going to the GP for antidepressants and all, all sorts of things. So um, I, I hope that all our contact with tenants um, will, be, will be positive. Um, a complaint was made um, that this report was in some way um, doing something uh, negative or bad. Um, let's be quite clear that if this report wasn't here at all, then what would be happening would be simply be the bedroom tax. This report is not doing anything worse than the bedroom tax would already have been doing. This report is seeking to do something achievable, maybe not as ambitious as some people would like. Um, the report itself falls far short of my hopes and expectations and discussions that I had previously had with officers about what might be in this report. Um, so I'm, I'm very disappointed with, with what is in this report. But um, what we have before us is perhaps something that is achievable within the law and within the council. So that is something that we, one thing that we can do. And I completely agree with Councillor Farrow um, that this requires a national um, this requires a national campaign and it does require a, a unified approach. I, I'd agree there. And um, going back to the poll tax, um, uh, thinking back to my appearance at Hove Magistrates Court um, sometime in the past for, for non-payment, um, I think we, we saw the effectiveness of um, what happened against the poll tax. But in this instance, I think we need to be quite clear that the money that we're talking about here is money coming into the council that pays for council services to tenants, and clearly we have to try and maintain council revenue, otherwise valuable services to tenants are cut. So there's a, there's a difference here. But I, I do agree with Councillor Farrow about the need for national coordinated action. Um, and I think it's fair to say this is probably one of the most unpopular measures that has happened in this country, I don't know, since about 2003, probably. Thank you, Councillor Jarrett. Other co comments or queries? I've got Councillor Mears and then I've got Councillor McCafferty. Councillor Mears. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to come back first on Councillor Jarrett's comments about he's unhappy with what he sees within this report and he would have expected officers to put in more. Well, I'm sure, Councillor Jarrett, as the administration, you would have been advised legally as to what you can and can't do around the HRA. So it's no reflection on officers as to what is in this report. This report states what can and cannot be done legally. So I'm sure you didn't mean that to reflect on officers, only perhaps your wording wasn't quite clear around that. Because my understanding, and I will still have a concern on 5.2, whether this in fact was legal, but I'm sure we will get an answer in the mouth. Perhaps Liz will qualify that for us. But as an administration, let's be clear, you are the administration. You would have had briefings on this. You would have been very clear what you can and can't do. And I have to agree with Councillor Farrow. I was very concerned with the Chair's comments that she made concerning there will be no evictions. No evictions. That was said nationally. And, you know, that sends out a very positive messages to tenants when, in fact, the report we have here today doesn't reflect that. So I think that was probably, um, you know, in hindsight, tenants could take that the wrong way. If we look at 3.12, as I said, tenants haven't been consulted. But 3.12 talks about asking tenants uh, the level of funding and how long it should continue and how it should be addressed, bearing in mind this is the HRA. Just to also go back to a comment that Councillor Jarrett made and Councillor Farrow, I, I mean, just a slight history lesson. So you talked about 2003, Councillor Jarrett, but in 2008 in this city, 75% of people in the private sector, which is the largest part of the housing in this city, were affected by the local housing allowance. It was a change by the then Labour government. If you look at the report, you will see the size criteria and the criteria around it is exactly, exactly the same as what is, is, is before us today. It is no different. So 
For 75% of the city's housing, and I was on housing at that time, and, and I know a lot of you weren't, but surprisingly enough, there was no, no um, noise from the then Labour group on this council, not one comment, and neither from the then Green members that were on this council, not one comment that the, the then Labour government had made these changes. And here we have it today, and the Labour councillors sitting beside me, shock horror, but their own go previous government did exactly the same, which is interesting. Also, there was a talk about social housing. And now, for those that know, I mean, I've majored on housing all my political life, and it is a real passion for me. So yes, I can quite occur with Councillor Farrow's comments, but then this Green administration really concerns me in, your, in actually your commitment to housing, because we've seen projects come through. Now I remember the then um, Councillor, Councillor Roundup, in council banging on about 50% affordable housing. He would never accept anything less, never. But we see through this administration policies that go through. We see affordable housing dumped down and dumped down and dumped down. 10% in the marina, 25% in other schemes. And, and affordable housing and family housing taken out. So I really do question this administration's commitment to affordable housing. If, it's no good shaking your head, Councillor. I think you, we were talking politics earlier, so I'm just expressing my view as you've expressed yours. So I think there's a real concern around it, it's um, very much you talk the talk, but actually there's no action. So really, around this, this, I mean, I'd be very interested in the Green administration's perspective now around this paper that we have here today. We heard previously around we, we have a collection strike at the moment, but we were told from this administration there will never be any cuts. We won't make any cuts. And now we have a paper before us today with 70,000. Now, I don't know how far you think that's going to go. So it, 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 it just feels to me, no disrespect to you, Chair, that this paper's been brought us before us today as a token gesture without the full consultation with tenants, without the impact, without looking to see around the Secretary of State because the HRA, we do need permission. It took four years for the LDV to get permission to go forward and I know because it was painful to push it through. So you, we, this council, you, this administration, can't do anything until you have permission from the, from the Secretary of State. So I would have thought in the recommendation it was a top priority because there's no good having any other recommendations if you can't do it. So, you know, it's all around the wrong way. I hear the words, I hear the words that's being said, but, but actually delivery is, is falling far short. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution, Councillor Mears. And perhaps the reason that we are in a slightly different position as far as the amount of affordable housing and things that um, developers in the city can actually offer is due to the financial state that the country finds itself in the mo at the moment. Um, so I've got Councillor McCafferty and then I've got Councillor Jarrett. Thank you, Chair. Um, are we going to talk through the amendment at this point or do you want to do that at the end of the general debate on this? Um, a very good idea. Let's talk, let's go through. Thank you. The Green Group's amendments. I, I, read haven't, it out had, I haven't had any amendments from any other group. Yeah. It's only the Green Group. I'll read it out because amendment. I'm aware that there are people in the public gallery Thank you, who, won't, um, Go ahead. who won't have read it. But I'll, I'd first of all um, point out to the previous speaker that it would be laughable to take advice about housing from the current government. But let's be honest, you're the creators of all of this mess. <laughs> um, we're doing a lot better than you'd ever do, Mary, let's be honest. Um, let's uh, move on to um, the amendment that our tables here and councillors and officers have seen it. And for anyone who has the report in front of you, page, on page two, under the recommendations, I propose two amendments. They read as follows. 2.4, that, that for a traditional transitional period until the 1st of April 2014, where one, all other avenues have been explored 
and two, transfer is the only option, but there are no suitable properties to transfer to, and three, where it is possible to clearly identify that arrears are solely due to the under-occupancy penalty, officers will use all means other than evictions and bailiffs to recover rent due. I've also added 2.5. Cases that meet these three criteria should not hinder a tenant from moving to another council property. Um, so we... We've amended this report. Um, I, I approached the chair earlier today, and um, as everyone would be aware of this committee, I've been put in as a substitute. Um, I've got no idea what um, Councillor Davey would have thought, um, but I didn't feel as if this report um, went far enough. I actually, um, if, we, if we can get away with the amount of money that we're asking um, from the Secretary of State, I'm sorry, I would double it. I, 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 would, go, I, I would go against the government's recommendation on a lot of this because they're trying to make it as hard as they possibly can. And um, as has been really emotively pointed out by Maureen, who gave the deputation to our committee today, the bedroom tax is one of the cruelest measures. It comes direct from the government that's intent on punishing the poor for the economic crisis. Over two-thirds of those affected are likely to be people with disabilities. The National Housing Federation estimate that 100,000 tenants who live in homes especially adapted to their needs are set to be affected. Now this, while ministers like Chris Grayling, who I don't know if you saw him earlier today, was pouncing about at the state opening of Parliament, he lives in a 1.3 million home while claiming expenses for a second home 16 miles away at the cost of the taxpayer of an unbelievable £127,000. So actually, we get a snapshot of, the, of, the, of what this government expects the poorest and the most vulnerable to live by. And that's why I put these amendments here today, because I feel as if the report does not go far enough, and I feel we need to have assurances, as we heard from Maureen and the deputation earlier, we need to be able to give our tenants assurance that they will not be affected because they cannot pay the bedroom tax. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor McCafferty. Can I now ask for guidance as to what do we do next? Well, second it. I second it. And anybody else want to second it? Thank you. Before you take that further, um, certainly, Councillor Mears. I think that's allowed. Thank you. Aware. It's, just, it's just on 2.5, if, if I could have a legal clarification on this one, because we all tenants sign up to a tenancy agreement and it's in the rent book and it does state in there about, um, about moving with rent arrears. So my concern is that is a legal binding document that tenants sign and we also have the rent book. If, if it's fine and it makes no difference, that's fine. But I just wanted clarity. Bearing in mind the tenants put this together uh, when they worked on this. This was worked through by tenants. And the tenants' uh, agreement and handbook was agreed by tenants. And it's their wishes that are in there. So I just want clarity around what we're agreeing to here before it goes any further. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mears. Um, Liz, can you? What's the sum of this. Thank you. Probably not what you want to hear. But basically, we have a discretion as the council, as the landlord, to allow a tenant with arrears to move. What we have got is basically a policy that says if you have arrears, you will not normally be allowed to move. The normally creates an exception. You've got a presumption against being able to move, but this allows you to consider each case on its own individual merits. If you have a policy that is so strict as to say, if you have rent arrears, you can never move, that would be unlawful, unlawful fettering of your discretion. So I don't have a problem with these criteria should not hinder a tenant from moving to another council property. But that actually is my understanding of the current state of affairs. Thank you, Liz. Thank you very much. So I second this amendment. So now we vote on the amendments. Further debate on the further debate on it with the new recommendations or with the old recommendations? With the new recommendations. Further debate on it with new recommendations. Is that correct? I'm just I haven't done this before so I don't know. Sorry? 
that's what I thought. So I thought we'd take a vote on the amendment now, and then we can debate it with the amendment. No. Sorry, Liz, please, yeah. We'll discuss the, we'll have discussion on the, on the amendment and then, first, and then take the vote, and then take the vote after. Oh, fair enough, on the amendment. Okay, that's the, that's fine. So we're having, so we're having a discussion now on the amendment. Is that correct? Is that what everybody thinks we're doing? Thank you. I'm seeing slow here, but I've just never done this before. I want to make sure we do it right. Councillor Farrow. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, I mean, it would have been helpful if we'd actually had this amendment more than two minutes before the meeting started. So I don't think that was very courteous of the Green Party. I'm sure it could have been provided a bit earlier. However, um, I support these, these amendments. Uh, my only concern is is that, and of course, I mean, that's the problem with the restrictions that we, those of us who are new councillors are finding the restrictions about getting things done. Yeah. Uh, and I'm concerned about what happens after the 1st of April 2014, because this only actually gives protection for our tenants for 11 months. Yeah. So that, that's my big worry. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, collectively we need to look at this um, I, I don't know what the answer is yeah. um, because clearly there's a financial implication about what um, 2.4 actually does. Uh, again, I wouldn't expect accurate information here today, but I'd like an indication because clearly where's that money going to come from? Is it going to come from the HRA budget or, is it, or have we got to go to the general fund mm -hmm. yeah th these things we do yeah, we do need to answer so, yeah. if we are actually going to stand up for tenants and look after the residents of the city we have to work together and it's very hard because political politics is a dirty filthy game as some of us are finding out as new councillors and well yeah mary laughs i mean I'm she's got a lot of experience and all the rest of it i just wonder why you're uh, here if it's so bad well you know some of us actually believe in what we're doing, representing the residents of our wards, and we've taken a bit of a battering for it, and we will carry on taking a battering for it. So all I would really ask, Chair, and I know it's not in this amendment, is I think we need to give some thought how, how we take it further, how we take this campaign. Now, I've suggested that perhaps we need a national campaign. Maybe that's through a motion to council and, and what have you. But... I, I just ask, you know, that that's put on the table. Thank you very much. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Farrow. Um, right, other people who want to come up. I don't know which one of you is first. Um, Councillor Fitch. Thank you, Chair. Um, I support the amendment that's been moved, but I, I'm having great difficulty that policy has been made on the hoof here. You are the administration. A substituted member comes in with a major amendment that... I don't even know if the Green Group know about it, you know, that are not here. Um, you can't run a council like this. It's not the way to do business. And, uh, you know, I support it because I think it is good, but I, it's not the way. You, it, you know, with respect, Chair, you, you keep saying, I don't know. Well, maybe you shouldn't be chairing the meeting. And I know you're going soon, but it seems to me that this paper, and I looked at it, is too little, too late. And... Uh, 70k is a drop in the ocean. Um, it, it really won't go anywhere to deal with this problem. And as, as an earlier speaker said, it, it take a thousand tenants in this desperate situation, it's 70 quid each. It goes nowhere to the kind of debts we, we're talking about. Um, I, I find it difficult because I... It looks like you as an administration haven't had a chat about anything. A paper's been cobbled together, put before us on a, a, on a meeting that um, you were advised perhaps didn't ought to take place on this date because no, more time was needed. And I understand the urgency to do something, but I think it's really embarrassing yeah. to sit here today to see an administration cobbling together um, policy. It's not the way business is done. Now, talking of business, um, business got us into this mess. The bankers, the rest of it, caused this crisis. Uh, we have a conservative-led government that is making it worse, that is hitting people hard, and at the same time, while screwing tenants, 
hitting people. The bankers are now getting bonuses uh, for getting us into the crisis and back out again. It is a diabolical situation, and I think I think it is outrageous what has happened in in the country and the way people have got away with this for so long. But it seems to me really, really cruel when you pick on the poorest people to pay the price. Going to those on low income, going to those uh, with who want to look after their families and make and bringing in financial penalties. And my worry today is I will support a move to do something here. Uh, but it's got to be legally sorted out. And I think whatever we do today, the tenants must be consulted. Um, of course. I, 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 I spoke with your MP last night and I, I said, you know, the 70K won't go anywhere. And she thought it might be just a small amount that the government might let us get away with or something like that. But it isn't the way to run run a council. Um, so, so, Chair, I, I really do think uh, that this, this meeting today should come out in support of our tenants. It should find all ways possible to raise the money to help them in this desperate plight. Uh, but but I, I despair at what, what's happening here. The 70K, as I said, is a drop in the ocean and it, it it won't go hardly anywhere to help. We need to get this to government. We need to get permission. But we really must talk to the tenants because, because if the tenants are the only place we can get the money, we will be talking big money, yeah. not yeah. 70K. Thank you, Councillor Fitch, and thank you for your words of wisdom as to how I can improve chairing housing. It's very helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Mears. If you've finished. Um, I've got Councillor Jarrett and Councillor Peltzer done. Councillor Jarrett. Um, yeah, yes, thank you, Councillor Pitch. Um, I will apologise um, for the late arrival of this amendment. Um, it is not an ideal way to do business. Um, there were some very good reasons for, the, for that, and I'm happy to explain those to you outside of this meeting. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you, you feel able to support this. Um, in terms of this being a transitional period until the 1st of April 2014, well, as you're aware, um, April 2014 Universal Credit comes in if they've sorted it out to, to run by then, which of course is... Uh, but, you know, I mean, either they defer it or they bring in a pig's ear. We, we don't know which it will be yet, but it will be one of those two. So looking at this situation, there's a much bigger discussion has to go on about the overall impact of universal credit and it's not something that could be done in a hurry. There are senior officers looking at this right now and of course this does have budgetary implications and this needs to come in the 14-15 um, budget. So for that reason um, it really wasn't sensible for us to suggest putting this beyond April 2014 at this stage. But let's, let's work on something a lot more solid and, and better um, thought out and funded um, for, for the future year. But it was important to get something in place um, since this situation is already occurring and um, there may already be tenants who are already accruing arrears as, as a result of these changes. So we've, we thought it was important to get something in place. Um, and I would say it still falls short of what some of us might wish to do. Um, but uh, we wanted something that would get, you know, sizable majority support and something that would um, not be thrown out by the lawyers tomorrow morning. So um, that, that is where we are. Um, for Councillor Mayor's benefit, I will just quote um, from what the Chair said about this subject. Um, I will therefore be bringing proposals that seek to ensure no household will be evicted from a Brighton and Hove City Council owned home as a result of spare room subsidy rent arrears accrued solely from that household's inability to pay. Um, so what the Chair committed to do was to bring proposals seeking to ensure that nobody would be evicted. Well, I think we have done the best that we could in the circumstances um, within the law. So... Um, it may be that we could have done a better job, um, but I, I think that at least we, we made an attempt. 
And I think um, the story doesn't finish here. Um, there is more that we, we can still do, and I'm sure that everybody, um, council officers and, and councillors, will be doing their best to find further um, steps that we can take um, up until April 2014 and beyond. Thank you, Councillor Jarrett. Councillor Peltzerdun. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, firstly, may I, um, I think, pay tribute um, to the deputation. I thought it was very moving, and I feel it was actually very much based on personal circumstance Indeed. and personal experience, and I, I think that means so much. Um, all right, I am a Conservative, and it is the Coalition Government that has brought this legislation in, but that doesn't mean to say that one wouldn't want to see mitigation in certain circumstances. Um, and I think that's very important because, you know, I, I can say that. I, I think it's been said sometimes on the, the Labour Party side particularly about being a council tenant. Well, my parents were council tenants and I lived in the council accommodation. Uh, thank goodness it was the Hove Borough Council. Um, so, you know, I, I do speak from personal experience, although as a much younger person then. Uh, I appreciate what Councillor Jarrett has said, and I, I think he's been very open and very, very honest. Um, I'm quite certain that many people would have wanted to do a lot more, but then came up against the officers quite rightly saying, you can only do so much. Uh, you know, and I, I, I think that, it, that is, um, I think, you know, sort of being so open about it is a testament to Councillor Jarrett. And, you know, I don't envy him in his position. Um, one or two things, do, do, do you just worry me about the amendment, it, perhaps if I could ask, just for clarification, mm -hmm. um, if someone was going, uh, a tenant was going to go for mutual transfer, i.e. therefore maybe to uh, another authority's um, accommodation, which could happen, yep. obviously, would I right and be saying that in fact if our tenant had a at a rear situation, that would have to be disclosed to the other local authority, because I, I, I think um, that, that, is, that would be important. I think possibly Councillor Mears was trying to uh, uh, allude to that. Secondly, um, with regards to 2.4 uh, uh, and um, Councillor McCaffrey's uh, first uh, amendment, um, I fully understand where it's coming from, and I hope in, in a way that it would be successful. Um, I think I, I, I have a, a worry um, regarding the question of the arrears, and I think it's very important that it is solely due to, in fact, an inability to make the contribution to rent by the tenant, because we obviously, I think, have a duty to all our tenants to ensure that we, in fact, collect rental um, from all tenants. Um, because obviously it is the tenant's money. Uh, rent, rental income is tenant's money. So I assume, obviously, that where we, under these circumstances, where in fact somebody does get into um, arrears, it's very simple to see that the arrears will equate purely to the amount of shortfall which um, tenants, that particular tenant, would have been experiencing since the 1st of April. 2013. But I, I think, Madam Chair, at the end of the day, although it is late, I, I think there is obvious definite merit in the, the amendments to the Green Group. It's, I think it's a pity that it wasn't in the original report, because the original report obviously was the administration's um, you know, uh, way of putting things forward. I think they've improved it, and I think Councillor Jarrett has very um, openly said why they've been able to improve it. And I think that's a sign uh, actually of a good politician when he's able to say what we had is not good enough, we're trying to do better. And I think it's very good that the Greens are seen to be trying to do better. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pelston. Um, Councillor Mears. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Fitch, actually, for his stirring speech. He usually does give them those. It's a shame his administration didn't do that. His um, administration in 2003 is...
Councillor Jarrett spoke about. And in 2008, in opposition, they didn't make representation around the local housing allowance for the private sector, who had many thousands of people on low income and on benefits that are affected. I didn't actually get an answer from uh, the officer around that, as if it's exactly the same criteria we have here today as we had in 2008. So I would like that clarified so that we know whether we're, we're using exactly the same criteria that was given by the then Labour government for the private sector in the country and in this city. And I mean, I'm, I'm happy to support this amendment. I can understand the, the, the reasoning behind it. My concern is where we are with this paper and the expectation that came out from this administration that there would be no evictions. I think probably this paper is the wrong way around and Councillor Fitch made reference to tenants. I'm really concerned that, uh, although not constitutionally, but morally we haven't consulted with tenants on this. We don't know if tenants would prefer to put more money in, but it is tenants' money, we don't know. So, you know, this amendment's come forward today, but we don't have their voice here. And reference has been made to the deputation, which, I, which was excellent, and I know how nerve-wracking it is to, to come and, and do that. And, you know, if we're going to talk about the past, I mean, I come from a council estate, I come from Whitehawk, and I've lived in council housing, and I've majored on, pay, on housing all my political life and I have a passion for it and that's not about politics and which party I'm in it's just that I, I believe housing is the most important thing that for people for children's services, adult social care we have to get housing right and that's my passion around housing but I have a concern around this because it is the wrong way around and so whoever whoever is the chair of um, housing in, in the next municipal year. I would hope that 3.12 in this report is taken forward properly. Pro tenants are properly consulted. We do have reports back that, that clearly shows their views because it's lacking. Councillor Jarrett's absolutely right. It's a very flimsy report. It has, no, it has no substance within it because we don't have a tenant's voice within this report, which, in my view, is very bad. So, yes, I mean, I will support this um, amendment. As I said, I still think 2.6 should have been the top one because everything flows from consent from the Secretary of State. So although we can take action around it, I think for tenants we will want clarity as to what, what can and can't be done. And um, as you know through the HRA, you can, you, know, you can make provisions for bad debt, but that's all you can do. Legally, that's all you can do. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot in here unanswered. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mears. Um, that's Chair, could that, the officer just clarify my oh, question sorry, around the local housing allowance from 2008 and if it's exactly the same as what we've got here today? My understanding is that it is, and apologies for not answering your question before, my understanding that it is the same, but I wouldn't like to say 100% word for word it's exactly the same, but I do believe it's, it's the same. <laughs> Thank you, Adodo. Thank you, Councillor Mears. Councillor Jarrett. Yes, um, since it's um, a time for apologising, could I also apologise to tenants for, for the, the way round that this has happened? Um, but there again, there were some very compelling reasons why this had to be brought Indeed. to this committee. Yeah. And um, the, I, I can't comment on whether there was or was not time to convene emergency um, panels. I, I'm not an expert on that. Um, I, I know some tenants perhaps wouldn't be very happy about having an emergency panel convened um, that they weren't able to go to, particularly over the Easter period. Um, but um, I'm quite sure that we will be seeking tenants' views, that we will listen That's seriously amazing. to tenants' views, and that this is not going away in this coming year. It will still, we will still be saddled with this horrific piece of um, change to the legislation for years to come. Um, at least up until 2015, if not beyond. And um, 
anything that tenants have to say about how we should go about doing this and how they feel um, what is the best use of resources within the HRA, we can take all those comments um, into account when, when drawing up something to, to go forward from April 2014. Thank you very much, Councillor Jarrett. As far as I'm aware, there's nobody else who wants to add any points to debate. I think, um, I think um, Jeff, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. It was just a, a, um, some advice I wanted to give the committee on, on the recommendation on the Green Group Amendment 1, um, which is paragraph 2.4, just the last um, uh, subsection there, officers would use all means other than evictions and bailiffs to recover rent due. Um, as members of the committee know, um, we do very, very few evictions. Um, it's a, really is a last resort for us uh, as, as a general policy as a landlord. Um, what I do need to advise you, it needs to be minuted really, is that obviously we haven't, because it's come as a, an amendment, we haven't covered that in the financial implications in the report. Now, I just, members just need to be aware of that. Um, obviously, as members have also discussed, um, the, um, the report and the implications are being referred to area panels, um, and there will be opportunities for us to bring back reports in the future where we can give you the financial implications of that um, particular aspect. Um, as, as I say, it's not our, you know, we, we try to avoid uh, evictions and um, bailiffs to recover rent due in all normal circumstances, um, but I just need to advise you that um, you have not been advised on this in terms of this particular report. Thank you, Jeff. As, sorry, Liz is just whispering in my, my ear, and obviously, therefore, there are some it's potentially challengeable, but um, you, as long as you're doing that, knowing what the circumstances are, and that's obviously for the will of committee. Thank you. Very, very, very rarely has um, history or policy really been made without a few risks being taken, I would say, as fair, certainly in, in British history and in Irish history that I know a lot about as well. So, um, yeah, so thank, thank you for that. And, you know, that's very important, what we've just been told. So having said that, go on then, Councillor Fitch. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's where... Will this have to, will this, because it finan has financial implications, will it have to go to P&R? Or is it, uh, my concern is there's been a good debate. We right. all want this not to happen. My right. It not may need tidying up in a way. My understanding is it doesn't have to go to P&R. Thank you, Chair. In terms of the report for the 70,000, no, it doesn't have to go to, to P&R because it's within the capacity, the financial capacity of the HRA, which has been our financial advice. Obviously, if we get to another stage in the process and there are other reports coming forward which might have more significant financial implications, then it is possible that it may need to go back to policy and resources. Thank you, Jim. Okay, so at that point, I'm going to move to a vote <coughs> on it. So, so we might we might vote on the amendments that were put forward. So, those of you who vote for the amendments, please. Unanimous. Thank you very much. So we have no abstentions and nobody voting against. Oh, brilliant. And then we vote on the, on the substantive. So those of you who are for the substantive report. Unanimous again. Thank you. I think it is so... A, such a good message to put out to a member of the public that, reg that all councillors in this room today have voted for there to be quite a radical thing. I believe, having done some research, or our group having done some research, I think we are one of the earliest councils to actually pass this. You believe we're the only council to have passed this in the Housing Committee. So thank you very, very much for that. And as it's my last meeting, it's quite a nice one to go out on, isn't it? Yes, good. Thank you. Right, we still have more business, though. That's all right. Thank you very much for your contribution, Councillor. So, our next... It's a presentation by Miles Davidson and Martin Reed, and it's on Home Energy Efficiency Options Update. 
Thank you.